This is the Adam Savage Project. I'm Adam. I'm Norm. And I'm Joey. Hi, guys. Hello. Hello. We return, uh, the three of us, be- just two weeks after we got together last to talk about The Mandalorian because the season's over. The and season has finished. So many of you out there have been pinging us about our thoughts and, of course, discussing among yourselves the reactions to all the revelations, uh, not only from the end of second season of The Mandalorian, but from that big Disney announcement of their slate of Star Wars shows that Lucasfilm is now producing. The uh, marvelization. We'll talking, <laughs> yes, the, 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 the MCUing of the Star Wars universe. Uh, we're talking about all that and more. Uh, today and this should be uh, about a week and a half after the season closed so spoilers within but we think it's fair there's been enough time to talk about it Uh, and certainly as we're recording this you know it's only been a couple days for us so new announcements may be happening so forgive us if we omit anything that gets announced in the meantime because news is coming fast and heavy but uh first a recap i guess we should do of not only this episode but the season Mm -hmm. uh Mm -hmm. as we start the episode it's chapter 16 called the rescue and which is which i'm so happy for that name just like screw anything subtle just bang the rescue and that's the 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 it's the, the whole sequence, right? Like they start right into a chase. You have a Lambda shuttle right from uh, Return of the Jedi. You have the, the Imperial, ex-Imperial doctor on there. They're being attacked. You have uh, Boba Fett slave one, right? Yep, With yep. Mando um, and uh, Fennec on there. And they go and, and capture the doctor. Wait, did and... we did we miss, did we have episode chapter 15 on our last we didn't talk about it ourselves i think we the haven't last talked time we talked it, no. was was the one before that the robert, robert rodriguez directed yes it was yes. the last i had it on okay yes yeah yeah where, where the boba fett was was brought into into the four who, for, for the who, show who directed the penultimate episode the precursor to the to the rescue uh it was written rick. and directed by so um, rick, uh, uh yes rick, rick, rick uh fumayua F- I want to say yeah. oh yeah. yes 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 he's already did one this season and definitely one last he season. did one last season yeah, yeah. this was probably yeah. my favorite episode of this season i don't know about you guys but i thought this was a fantastic episode this is the one with bill Barr with bill, bill burr bill burr yeah the, kind of the entire team do do the the uh the william friedkin sorcerer uh move the uh truck with the full of the full of the dynamite or whatever it's, yeah it is, the, I uh, loved yeah. that episode. I thought it was not only not only uh, super exciting, but I was surprised how moving it was at the end. Yeah, yeah. Bill Burr's like, I mean, we saw Bill Burr earlier in what last season? Yeah, last, last season. season. The, the right. We kind of get a sense yeah. of of who he is a little bit, and when he he's, he's kind of you know, we're not pretty quick, but this one like, we get like three almost like three main turns with him, right? He kind of trolls Mando a bit about his helmet, like just really like gets on him, kind of makes fun of him. And then in the inside the truck as they're driving, you kind of get that 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 moral conversation that he has with them regarding like what is what you know we're all the same. What does it mean uh, you know have the girl helmet on or helmet off? And then uh, and then we kind of and this is this is sort of a filmmaking technique that I I've, I think I've I like whether it's good or not, but it's understanding a character's past by bringing in another character to kind of explain what they've done, right? Oh, and they're yeah. inside the cafeteria and he's he's dealing with that general. Uh, but anyway, yeah, the Bill Burr stuff was all fantastic. This episode was was great. The camera work was awesome. The chase scene, the the action Chasing chase the choreography, scene where the pirates. They had the, the, the pirates coming in after them, the Mando fighting them off, the pirates. That was that was intense. I didn't know like you could tell when they're in the vehicle. That's very easy for them to do in the volume because they right. can just yeah. move that the the, the the image in the background. Uh, but all the stuff on him on top, you know, even with the camera moves around that, it was really like it didn't look like. <laughs> It looked big. It looked no. It you know, looked it, huge, and I kept on. Everyone always asks you both and me, um, "Are you guys able to suspend your disbelief for shows like this?" And the answer is yes, yes, yes. If the plot's great, I'm not thinking about anything but what's going on. But I did keep on trying to look at master shots and thinking. See, I have this. I have this engineer's brain part of me that if I think if 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 someone could wave a magic wand and I'm directing in the volume and I had to plot sets of shots, I might be like, I could easily imagine um, pulling some of my punches because of what I knew the, the volume could and couldn't do. Right. 
And what I see in the filmmaking is none of that. Like their master shots feel as giant as any big screen 70 millimeter master shot. Uh, they're, that framing that they're able to do and the way they're able to integrate the volume and fully CG composite shots uh, blows my mind. And I think last I, time I, we, I, sorry, go ahead, Ron. Oh, I'm, I'm saying I'm wondering if the if the volume is dynamic enough now, where it doesn't necessarily always have to be 360. If right. they're not doing a you know a, a, a mid shot with conversation, where they need to have a camera going around like right. three people, right? If they're just doing, if can they have a wall further like out, fly out a wall? Oh, I'm so exactly. totally sure. I'm sure right? that lots of things we see through doorways are the volume in the distance and modular oh, yeah. and make mm -hmm. it, and and that oh, yeah, allows yeah. more flexibility. And you can see the comfort with them in that. I also really liked the conversation between Burr and Mando in the truck cab because it's also a battle. It's a conversational battle, but Burr is trying to get under his skin. He's actually not just trying to do that for that. He's not trolling, yeah. but he's he's asking personal questions and you can feel Mando, mm, hey, step, you know, you... That push pull when you've seen him fighting actual things this whole time is really nifty to have the social dynamics of a conversation also feel like a fight in a way. I mean, we think about I and mean, to sort of reference MCU again, the, some of the best stuff is when there's two people in a car, you know, yeah. when it's Captain America and, and Black Widow driving to the military base. So that's when they can have those quiet moments. And that's when it feels very comic booky of just the dialogue, you know, bubbles like this. That felt very much like that here. Uh, and and if, that's why Bill Burr, I think, is great casting for this because it very much is his persona and pushing buttons and knowing that he's pushing buttons in the real world, too. Well, he's, he satisfies this really interesting um, thing of being very blue collar, right? Like solidly blue collar with his Boston accent and his manner and his lack of airs. Um, and then there's also the fact that he's crazy smart. I mean, I'm sure bar in person is, is whip smart and his character too, you know, is informed by that. And that's delightful to watch. Um, I also want to give a big shout out to uh, in, in the opening prison scene, uh, when they were in the prison camp scene, when they were getting Bill Burr's character out, uh, the scrap lockers in the back were yes! practical models by Tippett studio. And uh, that, that, that looked amazing. Yeah. Totally looked amazing. Uh, again, the scale of just that set, was was awesome and not only we were mentioning last time we'd spoken about the the camera movements and about how impossible camera moves are kind of off-putting and right. what i noticed with this chase scene like aside from like the, the masters and the the, the scale of everything everything that happened on the road and like from the battle on top of the roof into the the cockpit into just chasing the pirates everything was kind of grounded in a realistic way you would film that stuff there was a lot of like crash cam like or ca camera cars almost following the pirates yeah. like, even with the little mm -hmm. bumps in the yeah. camera like, they, <laughs> oh, they, yeah. like, they like really focus on that stuff and then and even just the like blocking everything you, you know you're in you're in the volume and there probably is a little bit of restriction on how much you can move the camera but they're able to come start on burr outside of the windshield then kind of slide the camera up around the car as you would have yeah. as a grip would normally rig that stuff to see you know mando fighting then back down around again to see the pirates and there's a lot of really I, cool <laughs> imagery like that i so enjoyed mando getting hurt wearing armor that wasn't his right when he came <laughs> back when he came back down you hear just hear him like oh uh, but i also uh, loved it like he puts his arm up to block something and the thing shatters it? the arm and he's like ah yeah. <laughs> So uh, the, the other really thing, notable thing about this episode, uh, which I believe is called The Believer, is the cafeteria scene, where not only right. is it you have Mando taking off the helmet, but also that intense conversation between Mando, uh, Bilber's character, and also the Imperial, uh, the lieutenant, the general. The Imperial that, that, bastard. Yes, <laughs> yeah, which is like a perfect bit of character acting of someone like I didn't recognize, but like. Yeah, you've seen them. Great. <laughs> sinister performance uh which gives um, you that imperial perspective and we got a little bit of that if, as we'll talk about the, the rescue in the opening of the rescue as well the name of the actor that plays krennic in rogue one mendelson uh, ben mendelson yes, yes i felt like the imperial bastard in the believer episode was modeling his performance slightly on ben mendelson's slow mendelson has a thing being he's an aussie am i right about that yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He has this thing that some Aussies do is that his his basic American accent almost feels southern. 
It feels, or in some of his delivery, there's a draw. A little bit of a draw, yeah. And I felt that in this Imperial officer. And I didn't know if that was on purpose or not, but I thought it was a neat choice because that guy was creepy. Yeah, oh, I really liked him. And Burr yeah. just like, just sitting there. You can see, you can read everything on his face. And then we're seeing Pedro Pascal, like <laughs> just for the first time in a long time, just like, nope, 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 don't do this. One thing I kind of wanted to see, Pedro Pascal's face should be like, should show the effects of having never seen the light. <laughs> <laughs> right? It should be almost Boo Radley. Yeah. Also, did you guys catch the um, Django Unchained reference? No. Yeah, I caught the Office Space reference, but not the... What's the Django? At the end of the conversation with the Imperial officer, <laughs> Bill Barr shoots him in the chest. He turns to Mando and goes... <laughs> which is totally uh which is totally what christoph waltz does in django right. when he shoots uh uh uh, uh what's his name uh, leo dicaprio leo yes. dicaprio yeah, yeah. I, I had to shoot him come on anyone would have shot him and that kind of high tense moment i mean it's, it's it was yeah really well written very quentin tarantino inglorious bastards you know when they're in the the tavern um in, in yes yes the, yes the nazis very much that kind of intense yeah. you know cat and mouse conversation game uh, the the actor um, who plays um, the villain Valen Hess, the actor's name is Richard Brake, and now I know where I recognize him. He plays Joe Chill in Batman Begins as a character actor. Do you remember there's that one scene in Joe the flashback Chill? and the guy who kills Batman's parents? He's like, I apologize. I, I I he like expresses regret like to the judge, and Batman tries to shoot him in the hallway, or Bruce Wayne does. Yeah, that's the same random oh, same funny. character actor. <laughs> wow. Like, 15 years later uh, and Bill Burr's character name is Migs Mayfeld. No one remembers that. It's Bill Burr. <laughs> Mayfeld <laughs> with a D? Mayfeld, yeah. Migs Mayfeld. Mayfeld. A, yeah, there you go. That's, um, that is such a, I, I swear <laughs> I feel like they almost must have picked that up from Hammett or Chandler or some Pulp Fiction type because it feels like such a mid-century uh, I talked to Migs Mayfeld down at yeah. Two Shores. <laughs> Like yeah, mid-century LA detective. <laughs> yeah. Totally. <laughs> um, so they get the location of Moff Gideon at the end of this episode, the light cruiser he's on, which sets the stage for all like, a lot like the first season, all like the, the cameo roles, supporting roles, everyone coming together um to this extraction crew for the rescue. So you got Boba Fett, you got Fennec, Ming Na Wen's Fennec, yeah. uh, Mandalorian, of course. They get Bo Katan and um, uh, the other Mando. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Before we jump into this, I loved the end of The Believer with Bill Burr blowing up the entire facility. And they turned him and he's like, Yeah, I just had to get that off my chest. <laughs> <laughs> that was maybe one of the more wonderful political commentaries within the show was the fact of that and then he's still ready to go back to prison when they free him and i mm -hmm. i loved that as an ending of an episode i look forward to meeting migs mayfeld some other in some other part of the star wars universe i'm sure he's oh, showing up. It's, an, it's an expansive universe now yeah. there's plenty of opportunity for him to pop up elsewhere uh okay so, so they get dr pershing from the imperial shuttle then they get bo katan and Casca reeves at a Another cantina. They got the cantina stuff locked down. I bet that department can put yep. up a generic looking cantina <laughs> with volume, with some foreground sets. Like, no problem. Yeah. Um, there's a nice fight there, I think, between Boba Fett and and uh, What's her name? And, and Casca Reeves. Right. Um, Casca Reeves, the one hired because of her appearance on Hot Ones. Yes, and she was a, a, a WWE performer. A, She's a wrestler. fabulous. And watching her fight with Boba is delightful. Yeah, I love the moment where they 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 do like they you know there's the classic if you're gonna get a wrestler if you're gonna get a fighter you're gonna have to use you use their move <laughs> use a signature move right throw them into uh, a table yeah sure. throw them to break the table and then yep. they both flamethrower at the same time <laughs> flame so stopping great. flame which uh, I think we, although we never tested it on the show I think that would actually work if if they're tuned so? correctly huh. really to flame, well flamethrower here... on flamethrower. If the, the pressure is pressure, if you meet it with its equivalent, but the trick is all you have to do to win is just turn yours just five degrees little... off and then you set fire <laughs> right. to the other guy. <laughs> oh, but That's then the you're on fire too now. <laughs> and respect they have. Yes. Uh, and then they do this whole attack on the light cruiser, which was a great bit of 
um, Bogotan um, of, of Starbuck getting to do a Starbuck style yeah, Starbuck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. landing crash landing into uh, the hangar. I, I've been having a cognitive dissonance because we are uh, almost done with season one uh, with the three hour movie and season one of Battlestar Galactica. We're watching it for the oh. second time. Um, and Katie so I'm, I'm seeing Starbuck every night and then yes. see Katie Sackhoff playing Bo-Katan is so awesome. Yeah. Uh, Boba Fett. It was weird at the, t- at the time, but it makes sense at the end kind of jets off at the end of that. Right. Yeah. He does. He destroys the TIE fighters, great little maneuver in space, and then just hyperdrives out of there and right. isn't, doesn't join them for the fight. Um, and I, I think it, it, it makes sense plot wise for the end because of the character. It would have been interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it would have been very interesting. It would have distracted. I think it would have been a lot of like, payoff. Whoop, 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 I'm not yeah, here. yeah. Yeah. Whoop, whoop, whoop. yeah I, I recognize you. Uh, <laughs> don't look at me. Don't look at me. And they have this whole assault. The whole, most of the episode becomes this assault where it's Mando sneak attacking, sneaking through to stop the dark troopers, the robotic dark troopers. And that sequence, um, did you watch Buffy? Yes. All right. So there's this moment at the end of the penultimate season of Buffy where she's death is her gift and she's about to sacrifice herself. And Joel Gray appears on the platform and he's like, well, this should be. And she just throws him off. Right. Like you think it's going to be some big fight and she just dismisses him. The fact of that, when Mando is dealing with the dark troopers and fights the like gets the door closed and evacuates all of them out that door i was like yes and those are my favorite bits it's the second time from the season you had that when they when when they were with bogotan assaulting and stealing those imperial weapons oh, they right. did the same thing like where did you say they are and then titus Welliver was like oh i roll and then the <laughs> <laughs> they, they they evacuate them into into space. The... I do have to say there are some pretty good comic bits in the show, <laughs> like quick little quick little gags like that that are great. Well, if I if I have one, my maybe my biggest complaint of the prequel movies, and one and two in particular, is that Han Solo plays such an important role in episodes four, five, and six in that. A movie as absurd as Star Wars needs, in my opinion, someone in the movie who's making fun of it while they're in it. Right. Like you have to address the absurdity. And Bill Barr does that. And every time he shows up, he kind of like, you believe this shit? And I the humor is a key way to kind of lessen and approach that absurdity to me. It's a it's a key weapon in that arsenal. It was interesting seeing going back to the little previous episode for a second, it was interesting seeing them do the dressed up as a stormtrooper thing. But Mando having just no skill or talent in being undercover in any situation. He was just frozen. Just right? <laughs> TP number? Like his, the terror on his face. I was like, oh my God, this is a guy who has not been able to like switch into another like persona at all. Ever. I mean, it's his skin, right? His comfort is yeah. his skin. The identity yeah. is so tied to the yeah. armor in that, that sect of the Mandalorian culture that he's in. That that's it shows so much there. Both also in the you know when he's in the fighting and when he's comfortable fighting, he assumes he has that armor and he's just taking those shots. Yeah. And, yeah. and again, an amazing bit of 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 choreography to make clear to the audience is that oh, he has to learn immediately a different way to fight because he can't rely on things that he has always relied upon. Yeah, that's yeah. that's fascinating. Yeah. Well, we see a lot of different ways to fight in this one because um, <laughs> he's trying to fight this death trooper. Dude, oh, sorry, dark trooper. dark trooper, and it's like it's like a Terminator fight. It just yeah. made me think of like the unstoppability of like an exoskeleton coming at him. Right, he was kept on firing those blasters, being pushed back, tossed around. The flame effects, you know, flame engulfing that yeah. arm. That, that suit was beautiful, uh, and it's, he's just lucky that he survives. I was yeah. reminded of the Golden Army, uh, mm. Hellboy Two, um, because he's a little like that. Like he's on fire, and he's like. Eh. Yeah, screw it. I'm still going to beat the crap out of you. Uh, while that's happening, you have well, the rest of the crew. Oh, yeah. Hold on. I just want to ask. I will tell you that when he sent the dark troopers out of the airlock, I was like, I'll bet they're coming back. Yeah. I don't think they, I don't Otherwise, think it would have been them. anticlimactic. I mean, it, part of me is like, okay, if they don't come back, I forgive them because they're probably very expensive to do. <laughs> yeah. And they need to get rid of these expensive CG robots 
in a in a nice yeah, yeah, quick way yeah. so you can have uh, there are more baddies to fight they're the mid-tier villains you had this already elaborate big fight scene with one of them so i would have been okay with that but they did come back and it was yeah. cool it made total sense you had the airlock there because they have rocket boots and it would have been a way to, for them to be deployed yeah. and potentially come back in and so it totally paid off i mean after that um, they were just making money rain on the screen with what they were showing yeah. <laughs> it's oh, like it's I mean, very expensive looking it's nice I was expensive think, episode i was imagining people on set going get me another panel for this hallway we've already shot 48 times today and i need it to look like a new hallway reverse reverse, reverse right, right? Like, exactly uh the rest of the assault with the four other members of the crew so badass and not just because all four of them were were women but also this unique fighting styles they had developed through the two seasons of the show we've seen mm. all came to bear, right? Fennec with the sniper, you had right. Cara Dune with the heavy, heavy weapon, like their personalities were, were right there yeah. um, as they mowed down those tr- stormtroopers. I really enjoyed uh, 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 her gun getting jammed. I was yeah. going to ask, <laughs> do laser guns get jammed? <laughs> Sure, yeah. It's happened in Star Wars. Uh, some part that's supposed to heat up or not sure. overheat right, yeah. uh, exceeds it's, it's, a, it's a good thermal... excuse to do some you know, Star Wars swearing lingo, right? Yeah. More dank ferricks out there. <laughs> I, I wish they could have come. Like Battlestar had such an elegant way with frack. Yes. Right? Where it would casually come out and it wouldn't sound corny because the, 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 the way the actors delivered it I don't think Dank Fair has that yet. No. Every every time someone says it, I'm like, ah, it's a little force. It's a little little cartoony as a as an a curse. Well, and having been like in sixth grade when the original Battlestar Galactica was airing, we all said frack as 10, 11, 12 year olds all the time and thought it was really fun. But none of us got to Mother Fracker, which is what the reboot of MS of BSG got to. Really, Mother Fracker? Oh man, that's cool. Uh, and then, you know, more fighting and more fighting. You have Mando reaching the cell. You get Baby Yoda, Grogu, in his handcuffs, and Moff Gideon there holding the dark saber. And uh, this was, I think, a spectacular, spectacular duel between them because you had like the you have the deception of moff gideon trying to play you know him him posturing saying yeah. he knew exactly you know i know everything that's going on i know you're out of ammo yeah. and two he tries the the bargaining he tries the you know which and which you would believe like i was ready for them to walk their separate ways to have right. them live another day yeah and then Could've they been. pay that off with a nice fit, fantastic battle with best car spear versus dark saber now, do you think that that was any was it, did that feel, I guess, like a betrayal on Mando's part to his team? I know there was some conversation around that. And, uh, like, well, you wait, know, how so? Him, him being so ready to like him, him coming up there with uh, with with Bo and with the crew, having this like, arrangement of you know we're gonna get him yeah. and him immediately saying like I don't care like do whatever you want you can leave just give me the kid. But I think I think it would have been technically a betrayal, but it speaks to his bond with Grogu. Like the and he the did thing, his priority. Like earlier in the episode, he did I think explicitly say like my only priority, <laughs> my right. only priority is this kid. Yeah, uh, it was an interesting yeah. conversation that I didn't think about until I read. It. I was like, oh. I um I I frankly the end of uh of the believer in which uh, Mando sends a video message to uh, Moff Gideon that mirrors Moff Gideon's season one right. closer. Um, I thought that was some lovely stagecraft from Mando, right? The idea that he would send a similar message to his enemy and with a similar phrasing and all of that. I thought that was, again, more of that uh, strategic martial knowledge that Mando has. Well, just also poetic, you know, writing, because yeah. they mean so many different, they mean completely different things right. with the same words. Yeah. Uh, and, and it underscores that emotional connection. Yeah, it speaks uh, to how like, personal this has become for him yeah. and how, how important it is. It's... I'm also glad that Grogu didn't jump in. It wasn't a uh, deus ex Grogu Machina, like, uh, like <laughs> being saved by a waving hand of, a, yeah. uh, of, of Baby Yoda, that he defeated Moff Gideon on his own and it was amazing, amazing fight. And it was, it was like great effects. Like you get a sense of the power of that weapon and also the limits of Beskar. Yep. And yeah. And then that leads them all to uh, the bridge where you, a couple revelations. First of all, 
that Mando having the dark saber <laughs> is problematic. <laughs> is, is for Bo Katan and and <coughs> the the creed that she stands by is is that that must be won through battle. Uh, so that is laying the groundwork for the next season potentially. Yep. Yep. I did really like his his he he just did not care about here take it I can see I don't care about this thing yeah. <laughs> like right. trying to give it to her yeah. she just wouldn't <laughs> have it nope <laughs> and then uh, uh, Moff Gideon's making subtext text he's like oh no 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 the dark saber has no power yeah. the words around it have power <laughs> exactly exactly the myth the myth of Star Wars yeah uh, and then you know the dark troopers come back fly back in and. It could have been a cliff. Again, there's so many moments I would have forgiven them if they made that a cliffhanger. Right I'm there. I'm really glad they didn't. Yeah. Right. But I would have. I would have believed it. Yeah. Like you know, and they they there are minutes left. Many there's like 15 minutes left on the, on the runtime yeah. at that point. Oh really? And yeah, yeah. It's a 46 minute episode. 15 minutes left on that runtime, and then an X wing shows up. And I want to. This is where I want to ask your thoughts. What were you thinking? As, well, that, as that showed up. So let me just say, we're getting into the biggest spoiler of the season oh, right. finale. We, so this is from here, here so on out. If, we're, we're, if yes. you okay. haven't watched, I'm about to tell you that I had the ending screwed for me. I am really good at not looking at spoilers. I am. I have been really good at not looking at spoilers. But last Tuesday or something, Somebody had an article on one of the sites that said, now that Grogu is safe with Luke, what happens next? Oh and I'm a little pissed about that. I, I, I'm i not spoiler precious. I take my lumps. But that one, I'm like, I couldn't even, un you know, I was like, now I can't unsee it. So I was just waiting. As soon as I saw them loaded up in the hallway and the X-Wing comes in, I knew it was you're, you're, you, What you were being deprived of is the emotional, the thought process, right? Yes. The, the, the unpacking, especially with it being so drawn out, with yeah. it being so layered, with an X wing <laughs> first landing, with the hooded figure, uh, could then it be? the green could lightsaber. Who yeah. could it be? Like you, they draw that out, and mm -hmm. you know they drop the clues at exactly the right moments where you see the a glimpse of the hilt, you see the gloved hand, yeah. and and then you see you know the silhouette that mirrors the Vader silhouette in Rogue One, right? Like all of that is so nice where you feel. Like it's just barely a step ahead, and you're screaming at the screen. Like that's the satis that's the satisfaction. I'm sorry, you're deprived of that. I was yeah. deprived of that. I will say the cloak reveal still made me laugh out loud, like with yeah. great <laughs> satisfaction. I um, I was kind of in the same thing as you, Adam. Like I, but mine is due to Mark Hamill himself. <laughs> I opened up Twitter oh. that morning on Friday morning and saw Mark <laughs> Hamill tweet. So what did you guys think of the ending? I'm like, oh. my mind, I'm like, all right, that, I'm going to turn off Twitter. I don't think that Mark Hamill would ruin anything, so I'm not going to believe that. And then I kind of forgot about it. And then when I saw the X-Wing show up, I was like, Mark Hamill! <laughs> oh, Skinner! <laughs> what you need are the memory pills that, you know, erase your short-term memory I just before watching the show. The eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, I'll say that I wasn't spoiled that it was Luke, but I knew that there was, because everyone, you know, the, the thing that yeah. was popular on Twitter was like, don't read. So I knew something was going to happen. Yeah. And I became too infatuated with the idea as the X-Men landed. I didn't have the timelines perfectly aligned, but in my mind, like, oh, is this be. Kylo Ren? Is right. this Ben Solo after he leaves? Because oh. that so would have been. He, he no, would I knew it was too early for that because yeah, Ben Solo early. is would only early. be five years old or something. Yeah. So yeah, what they could have done, what they could have done was instead of R two show up behind Mark Hamill, Mark behind Luke, you have you have four year old Ben walk out and go, "Come with me, Grogu. Uh, Grogu. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll look after you until the end, and then just <laughs> and then just do a thriller freeze frame <laughs> eyes." Joey, I, I won't I won't consider my life complete until you direct a horror feature. I'm just <laughs> I'm laying that out there. Uh, but of course, the the reaction from the fans have been just one of immense satisfaction um, because this is a fulfillment of on live action at least. And I think yeah. you know it, it bears mentioning that 
you know, Luke Skywalker has been portrayed in novelizations, in comic book form, in video games, in animation, but there is something about live action that people hold especially precious as even though everything else may or may not be canon, to see it on screen, to see the choreography, uh, that that checked a box for a lot of people. And actually, uh, in some of the cursory research I did, apparently within the novelizations of the extended Star Wars universe, there's still precious little plotting about what Luke is doing post Jedi before we meet him in the in the sequels. Mm-hmm. In the new, yes, the new. Can- can- so there's a yeah. lot of room for them to move around in there, and I really, yeah. I really appreciate that. His his youngified face is in some ways amazing and in many ways it is um every bit leia's face <laughs> yeah burn it, burn it with fire it's i mean they, they specifically didn't have him emote too much yeah and so i i, I think at least i'm i don't i'm glad they didn't recast right like didn't just have sebastian oh Stan no 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 in a wig, could... right uh I, it's i think it would be tough for them to do that um, so it had to be a CG overlay on top of a, a body double for the for the action. There's an aspect that I found super thrilling, which is at at uh, <clears throat> 83. So at 16, when I saw Jedi, I remember being moved about how far Luke had come since Empire. Right, that, that time, when yeah. He, yeah, when, when he stands, like Hamill... Hamill is undersung as an actor because he's phenomenal and he's done amazing things. And the, the 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 physical confidence he imbues Luke with at the end of in Jedi and again in this is really lovely to witness. And I felt a direct connection to that Luke that I saw at 16 years old. And that Even felt the really beginning neat. of Jedi when he walks in the Jabba's palace. So the deleted scene of him putting together his lightsaber like that's that's such a stark difference. It shows the time jump yeah. between where they are at the end of Empire uh, and where they are at the beginning of Jedi. There are uh, so, uh, yeah. there are lightsaber artisans uh, right now arguing over whose lightsaber was purchased and used as Luke's. Um, oh, yeah, interesting. If one was, I it could have been built, but I mean, you know, if I'm the prop master, there's so many amazing hilts out there. I would just be buying like my friend Rilo's or somebody's. <laughs> it, gives, it makes me think of completely unrelated when they made the last X Men movie. They had to f- dig up the the guy who, the prop collector who bought Professor X's wheelchair, Patrick Stewart's <laughs> wheelchair from the first one to use on set for James McAvoy. That's so they would have the exact, you know, special custom made X wheelchair. Hilarious. Yeah. yeah. Um, but what does this mean for the end of Ooh, this wait. arc? I also, listen, I, you know, there's a lot about Star Wars universe that Favreau and the entire Mandalorian team aren't talking about. And I really appreciate that. Like they're, they're their own unit and all of that. But I really appreciate the nod to the rogue one, Darth Vader decimating rebels in a hallway, yeah. Luke decimating troopers in a hall. But that yeah. I thought was a great bit of franchise connection. It was measured. It was methodical. It wasn't wild, right? He was in control. He was confident. Uh, And, you know, for all the people who say, this is the Luke we've been waiting for, right? I don't think that's mutually, like, you can, it's not mutually exclusive with also loving the portrayal and appreciating the portrayal of Luke in The Last Jedi, because you couldn't have this Luke in The Last Jedi. It's fundamentally 25 years later after this, you know, there's so much story to fulfill it, but now they're filling in the blanks and so yeah. it, it's appropriate and, and that's you know the benefit of them working in this time frame the way um, they revealed it too like the starting with the security cam footage and, and then slowly kind of moving your way out until you get that last final sequence was a really cool reminding me yeah. like godzilla <laughs> some of the better scenes of godzilla um in the season one finale they pretty much let you know what season two was going to have as an overarching framing device but in season two's finale no such luck we have no idea where we're going to end up. Well, especially I mean, with all the new shows and the characters right. moving on right. to and other things. That's the other thing that blows my mind is that a week before the finale, they reveal a slate of, was it 10 new Star 10 Wars shows? Star Wars shows over the next couple of years, animated and live action. Included. And then plus one after the And then that wasn't finale. even all of them. <laughs> yeah. they did a one more thing. And that's why even at the end of the episode, there were six minutes left. And yeah. you, you just watch the trail or watch the credits. And then you had a, uh, a post-credit stinger well, announcing the Book of Boba Fett. 
the thing is, is that the way I watch, my wife hasn't been watching Mandalorian with me. Um, she will eventually because she can see how much fun I'm having watching it. But in general, what's happened is, is that it's usually like I'm finishing an episode. She comes down just as the credits are rolling and she's like, oh, my God, these drawings and paintings are so beautiful. And I'm like, yeah, totally. And then the season, the season finale happens and it's all black. And I'm like, well, I guess there's nothing. And I turned it off. I didn't notice how much time there was left. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, the post credit stinger, I mean, it's fan service because, you know, you go back to Java's palace, you have, uh, what's his name? Java's oh. second in command. Ben Fortuna. Yeah. Yeah. Ben Fortuna <laughs> survived the, the barge attack and, you know, has become. Everyone survived. <laughs> Everyone survived. <laughs> and now Boba is the new hut. Uh, that la- classic pose, at the end, such a like Conan, the barbarian style, right. one foot Very up Conan. pose with, you know, with a, a lieutenant off to the side in Mignaz Fen- uh, Fennec. Uh, and the confusion was that some people thought, I, I was inclined to believe it, that the Book of Boba Fett could have been Mandalorian season three, that they're just like Certainly. telling another part of the Mandalorian anthology. Uh, but no, it will be its own separate show. And Robert Rodriguez uh, is pr- producing that one too. Dude, that's so exciting. I mean, the thing about Rodriguez that is so exciting is he's not only an amazing action director, but he specifically trained himself to work on super tight budgets with only what he needed in every shot. I mean, it's so precisely. I remember reading an interview with him where he'd be like, just build this door with one foot of wall and they'd build a 10 foot wide wall. And he'd be like, what are you doing? <laughs> All I need is just this, and that's all I'm going to frame. Like, he's perfect for this type of low-budget, high-quality production. And so we, we, we can expect him to become kind of the Dave Filoni for this show? Is that the idea? Is he is he kind of going to be the, sh- the showrunner-ish? With like- they haven't announced the specifics yet. It's still also Favreau and Filoni produce as well, because I think all of this set in the same time frame will tie together for some type of big event. Uh, but uh, I can't imagine he's have uh, has a, a deep hand in it, and you know if, if he's available, and it sort of sounds like he's interested. Uh, mm-hmm. I, for one, very excited to see Danny Trejo inevitably <laughs> pop up in the Star Wars universe. <laughs> Hilarious uh, and Lava Boy. Yeah. <laughs> and then, so you also have Ahsoka as a TV show. Yeah. You got the uh, was it Rangers of the New Republic. Uh, which was no super, not a ton of details. Presumably it's the Dave Filoni character that he plays, the X-Wing Wait, be, before we go into this, I just want to quickly jump back. I think this, I think what happened here is, and I was talking to Normal bit about this offline, but like trying to figure out my complicated feelings throughout Mandalorian season two about like some of these old characters or some of these new characters being brought in and not really getting it. I think my... The thing that kind of shocked me the most during the season that I couldn't quite put my finger on was it seems like they were kind of setting up backdoor pilots, right? Yeah. You have these they, episodes that have these characters. I mean, even Boba Fett, I'm, I'm glad he he wasn't a main character. He was kind of a supporting character. That makes sense. They want to save a lot of his personality development for this next show, including uh, uh, Ahsoka and, and the rest. But I think that was a that was an odd thing at the time that I felt that I'm now understanding. Like, right, they're getting right, ready right. for a ton of shows. <laughs> A question, though, do you think because of the success of Mandalorian, I, I, I think just from a from an acknowledgement of the, the, the fans uh, part of it, like Grogu has got to come back at some point. Right. I don't think oh. Grogu and Mando, that's the heart of the show. I, I think they're going to find a way somehow to, to reunite them. Maybe it's a time jump. Who knows? Right. Uh, yeah. But is a Mandalorian the show their flagship show? Is that going to be the anchor for which all these shows kind of revolve around? Um, uh, and, and maybe that's a creative thing. Maybe like so. Is is, is Mando the Tony Stark of the yeah. Star Wars extended universe? <laughs> yeah. And and is and is Filoni and Favreau is that the one they're most passionate about? Perhaps because the one right. they, they grew from the ground up. Yeah. Um, they have confirmed it's going to be a season three with Pedro Pascal. Uh, no other details there. Uh, but if they make that the show where they explore the history of Mandalore and Bogotan and, and the dark saber, right. I don't think, I don't think it has to be a little more than that. I think they got to bring the Grogu of it back into it. 
it'd be interesting to see how he ages as well. I mean, he's a child at 50 right now, right? When when Mando gets to become old and on his deathbed, is he still going to be the child? <laughs> is, right. Is he still going to be a young Todd? Well, I mean, so Raymond Chandler famously said that in every story is this is the protagonist's search for a hidden truth. And I think that what Mando's looking for is who he is, right? He's not a... He's not born on Mandalore. He is a foundling. He's a foundling. So he's within the religion, but he's still not necessarily exactly that. He has a different past. Uh, so I'm curious about the, you know, the, one of my favorite moments this year is when Bo-Katan is like, oh, you're one of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To let us yeah. know there's this whole panoply of Mandalorian uh, 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 uh uh, executions yeah, she's, out she's there, also you know? one of those like in that she has her well, beliefs and yeah. her superstitions about the sword and everything and it, yeah and, it seems like everyone in mandalorian or they're all kind of lost toys like they've all they've all been a part of something and now have been are now exiled or now taken out of what and who they were and now trying to find their own identity which was i, th- I felt what was so special about him and grogu's relationship like you know grogu with star wars has always been kind of a thing where you're you're strong in the force therefore you're special to someone you're special to the plot you're special to a person and this grogu was force strong but he was special to mando for very different reasons because it right. helped him kind of grow out of of what he was as a as this you know cultish mandalorian into becoming a person who cared um a key thing there we're also probably going to deal with is the 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 legend that jedi and mandalorians were enemies I, I that's gotta that's gotta come into this in the uh, in a subsequent season yeah and and there are more jedi right there's J- jedi there's ex-jedi you have yeah. ahsoka out in the world like how they reconcile luke being a presence like will luke will it just be referenced that luke is out training new padawans somewhere and ahsoka is doing her own thing like how is that going to be addressed yeah it has has ever been right um and then there's the beautiful parting of Grogu and Mando. So that was the emotional core. I mean, like as much as there was such joy in seeing Luke do his thing and fulfill that uh, fantasy, um, his that performance, the CG performance, I think was extra stiff in contrast to what was happening on the other side of the room, which was yeah. the Mando taking off his helmet and and saying goodbye to grogu like that was just so so powerful like luke cg didn't bother me but it was probably because i was trying to look through a just a wall of tears (laughs) i couldn't see him i i also when mando says he doesn't want to go with you i said to the television he needs your permission and then luke (laughs) is like he needs your permission i'm like exactly (laughs) oh just like the touch on the face oh everything was just uh the um the i haven't done a study of it but i feel like the puppeteering of grogu has been a progression of him having more and more character and i don't necessarily i think that's partially just from them understanding the character better and also the mechanics of uh uh, uh legacies uh beautiful prop and what they learned they could do with it and under different circumstances. But that final one, that hand touching his face just feels it's such a such a real moment. It was amazing. Mm-hmm. And you gotta believe also that institutional knowledge, they're not gonna let that go by the wayside. No. Like, there's too much money in Grogu for Grogu not to be in the show. <laughs> Maybe the next season is we open on Grogu being able to speak having been trained and now he wants to go find his dad again yeah i'm hoping it's that and not that he is the fate of the knights of ren (laughs) (laughs) just season three opening frame one just grogu cut in half on the ground knights of ren standing above him (laughs) uh i got two we got two knights of ren costumes already we're ready to go daryl and i uh and it sounds like it feels like as intertwined as these shows are going to be, they're going to be staggered. So it's not like we're going to get, you know, three of these shows airing at the same time. We're going to watch episode right. one of each. And then, you know, yeah, except for Mando and Boba, Mando and the book of Boba are going to be the same time. Uh, that... They said, uh, both December Boba is next. Yeah. End of next year. And Mando, they haven't said when Mando season okay, three cool. is in there, but like, I think the best thing for them is to do kind of, you know, let's do, eight weeks of this show, then eight weeks of this show, 
and roll into them. So you get like different flavors. So you know, you're going to get a Star Wars, a Jedi Ahsoka show. You're going to get a Bounty Hunter mm. show. You're going to get uh, an X-Wing New Republic style show. Uh, all that seems very cool. Hey, Disney, send Tested to all the sets. <laughs> <laughs> or just the one volume and let us or you know, just one book, <laughs> please. Are any of these, like, is there any one show out of the slate that you're like most excited about? Or movie, I guess. Uh, I, Patty Jenkins, Rogue Squadrons. I'm pretty excited. I was pretty excited about that director reveal. I don't know if you guys saw that. Oh my God. What so was that? beautiful. The she... Patty Jenkins video where she talks about her father being a, a pilot a, um, oh. and it's revealed the very end. She's always wanted to make her, you know, her Top Gun essentially uh, the best Top Gun movie. And now she has opportunity and she puts on um, an X-Wing pilot's costume and helmet and walks toward an X-Wing. <laughs> and that is the next star. I movie. had no idea. That's amazing. It's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I think the, the Rangers of the New Republic, I think I, I want to see that, that part of the mythos, right? Like th- that, that, that's the, the pure, you know, it's, it's the pure, the, the heroic side. And then, you know, it's creating some drama out of that. I'm really interested in the, uh, there's the one that happens kind of pre, like hundreds of years before, a new yeah, hope. The acolyte. It's the acolyte. Uh, it's yeah. The, in, the, in the high Republic. Uh, high Republic. So right. Again, that sounds like it could be interesting if they, if they play that right. Like I, I want to see, I want to, I want to see like a good city, urban noirish star Wars. That's not just like, let's just put an alien as a, as a cook at a diner. Like I want right. to see <laughs> what the urban development is like with when you have that many different species and people. And I have and a factions. guarantee if it's hundreds of years in the past, we're going to meet Yoda. Like a younger, yeah. like a spry Yoda. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> they have the technology. We're gonna yeah. meet. Imp- we're gonna meet impulsive Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> Had to work out a lot. I did. <laughs> uh, fantastic season overall. Like I don't think any of us expected not only where this season would go, but that it was laying the groundwork for so much more. It's amazing um, how much bigger this season felt than last season. Uh, how mu- how big the chase sequences were, how big the master shots and stuff. And all the framing stuff just gave us such an incredible sense of place. And I hope the production team at Lucasfilm still uh, do what they did with these two seasons, which are give directors a chance to, to make it their own, to write the episodes, to direct them, and have fresh directors as well as uh, experienced ones. Um, and and the, the the soundtrack's been great. Uh, Love yeah. uh, Gordonson soundtrack. Oh yeah, amazing. Um, pulling in some John Williams at the end here. You know, I think it's it's, it's yeah, it's uh, Star Wars in long form, right? That's that's yeah. what we wanted. Yeah. Live action, long form. That's what we're getting. Totally. Um, so it's yeah, it's been fun going over the episode with you guys. Uh, so much fun out there. I hope you guys enjoyed that as well. I'll let us know what you think in the comments. And yeah, this is the last episode of the year for us. Well, what a right. year. Uh, what a over. year. We are live, which is perhaps the most important thing to delineate. Like, <laughs> the threshold for this year is pretty low. Living at the end of it is a success. <laughs> <laughs> and we got so much exciting stuff to come on the site, untested. Things we've shot that we are holding. Oh, my God. We have not so been able to much show. stuff we haven't shown anybody. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The COVID not only put, you know, production on hold, but put so much of our post-production of things that we have already put in the can on hold. Um, so we're really, really excited to share the, that with you guys. Oh, That's my sure. goodness. So many visits, set visits, <laughs> all sorts of, holy cow, you guys can't even believe I, it. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, have a wonderful new year, both of you. You too. you too, Norm. You too, Joey. Everyone, Thanks, we'll man. see everyone in the new year. Yes, stay safe, wear your masks, and um, happy new year. Bye, everyone.